The blockchain technology allows you to go directly to the recipient of your art. Directly. You don't need anyone between you and the person that's going to enjoy or and invest in your art. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Violetta Zeroni. If you don't know who Violetta is, she's an independent singer and songwriter. She hosts a daily space called Moonshots and NFTs. She's launched two music NFT albums, Moonshot and most recently, Another Life. Violetta, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Hey, Michael. Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing very good. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. Today, Violetta and I will explore how she launched her NFT music collections. And full disclosure, I own uh, one of her most recent NFTs. So um, before we go there, I would love to hear your backstory. Um, how did you get into music and ultimately into NFTs? Start wherever you want to start. Yeah, so I I got into music really early on. My dad uh, is a musician. You know, he plays music for for a hobby his whole life. He's an artist. He's an illustrator. So, you know, very artistic. And when I was three years old, he noticed I had a good voice and got me into you know a children choir and then piano lessons. And I did classical piano for about eleven years, uh, and then developed songwriting through you know learning the guitar and. Um, at the age of 18, I participated to the talent show X Factor in Italy, got to the final, signed to a major label, made music my career. And uh, after a couple of years of being with a major label, realizing it wasn't for me the way they had it, you know, planned out for an artist like me, where I don't have a say in my artistic decisions, let alone the business decisions, of course, became independent and pursued my independent career for about eight years. Uh, very tough, very uphill, but a lot of great experiences. And eventually, about a year ago, found Web3 and NFTs. And right before I quit music forever, because I couldn't pay my bills anymore, I, I discovered that I could put out my music as NFTs. And through my mom, my mom told me about NFTs, which is, you know, kind of a cool thing. She knew about NFTs before I did. Um, uh, real quick, I want to I want to back up the story and slow the story yeah. down a little bit. So talk to me a little bit about like the starving artist era, you know what I mean? And like how, cause so many people would assume if you win a big television show in your country, right. In Italy, that you would just have it made. Talk to me about a little bit about the struggle and then ultimately how your mom introduced you into it. I, I'm fascinated to hear that story. Yeah. So I didn't win. I was third. I placed third at the end, but still, you know, I got a big record deal from a, a major label. It wasn't, I would say, considered a big record deal, but it was a deal with a major label. But it, it's what you call a 360 deal, which means they take a cut off of everything you do. Um, and you don't really have a say with anything. Everything is in management, publishing, live shows, like everything, you know. And I signed this deal without knowing what I was signing because I was 18 and they got me into their office day after the final. With, and they didn't tell me to call a lawyer or my parents, but I was of age and I just signed it on the spot for five, five years deal. Right. Wow. So almost like kind of illegal when you think about it. Um, and so, you know, after once I was with the label, you know, I either did what they wanted me to do or they shout, they would shelve me and they did shelve me. Like they were like, okay, no, you're not the kind of artist, but you're tied to us. So also, what does that mean? Shelving? What does that mean? It means that you're stuck. Basically, you're stuck in this deal, but they just put you to the side in case you blow up one day, not because of their work, but because of your work. And so that they can reap the benefits. Right. But they put you there. They don't let you go. They don't release you. They keep you waiting, you know. And so that's what happened to me until I was able to get out of the deal because they didn't realize that they had to release one of my albums as per contract and they didn't. So I was able to leave. Um, but yeah, I basically did very, very little after the X Factor. And yes, I had a few songs charting, but that's nothing. You know, you have to like be able to get out there and do things. And I wasn't able with the label. And when I became independent, you know, I finally was able to write the music I wanted and play the shows I wanted and be a lot more free. I was still a little bit of a starving artist for a few years. You know, I never made a rich living, always a, a humble living. I had to diversify a lot. But the real starvation, you know, came when the pandemic hit because, you know, that 
basically I couldn't perform any more, any shows ever for two years. And that was my main source of income. So then your mom, tell me the story about how that happened with your mom coming to you with this NFT idea. Well, basically I, in July of 2021, I decided that I'd had enough. And I was like, I'm 26. I've been doing this for almost a decade. I want to find an alternative. Music will always be with me, but maybe not as my job. You know, it's okay. Not everyone can make it. Um, but before I give up these almost 10 years of work, I'm going to give it one more year, make the best album I can possibly make, and then try to shop it to labels. Again, going back to record labels. So I, I did it. I went, came to Nashville, recorded my Moonshot album, um, and then started shopping it around to labels. And again, no, your music is outdated. It's out of fashion. It's way too old school. We can, you don't have numbers on TikTok, whatever. I was almost given up and then I went home for Christmas and, and my mom was like, hey, before you give up, have you heard of NFTs? And I'm like, no, and I'd never heard of them. And I thought it was stupid at the start. I'm like, how are people buying songs for like $100 when they can get them free, you know? But then I started looking into it and it all made sense in my head very quickly, so. Okay, so you started looking into NFTs because your mom kind of sent you down the path. Did you get inspired by any other musical artists that had already gone to NFTs? Or what did you find when you got started, there were very few musicians that were actually doing NFTs? And how did you go from an idea to execution? I would love to hear a little bit of that. Yeah, regarding the inspiration, you know, no artists I knew were doing it. No artists I knew personally or not personally. I didn't know about anybody. I knew about Snoop Dogg. That's all. But that's it. But then when I started looking into it, I found some podcasts online and I started hearing musicians that were kind of in my situation before and who managed to make a living. Um, and, you know, they were unknown to me or to the masses, but they ma managed to put out successful collections and, you know, bring value to their holders. And so I took a lot of inspiration from, from them, like Dill, for example, who was in this space with me today. Dill and Domino and Nifty Sax, Spotty Wi-Fi, all these people inspired me a lot. Um, and I just started listening very, very carefully and doing a lot of research, taking notes, you know, really a deep, deep, thorough dive into what NFTs are. I was completely ignorant on the blockchain and crypto as well. Never used it before. So I had a lot to learn. Um, but I met in the space through this podcast that I heard, I met Nifty Sax, who's an Italian saxophone player who is, you know, had done a very successful NFT collection, got in touch with him just to exchange some ideas and say hello. Turns out he had just started a little project with his dev where they were trying to onboard artists and launch them into the NFT space through music. And so I started working with him. He became like a mentor to me and a dev, and we launched the first collection together. Yeah, and when did you launch that collection and how how did it go? Tell us a little bit about that first one. Yeah, the very first one, I launched it like two weeks into me being in, a, in, in the NFT space. So very, very fast. I sold, it was 15 editions each. When, when was that, by the way? Do you remember when that was? Oh, that was like end of January, 2022. Okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I put out 15 editions uh, for 0.1 each. Uh, and that was like more money than I'd ever made in my life through my music, pretty much. And a short, short amount of time, right? And then I put out a one of one music video that I sold for almost four ETH. Wow. And then I saw someone flipped it after two weeks for five ETH. And I was like, what's going on? Like, people are actually making profits from my music, you know, and enjoying utility. And then shortly after, I was like, okay, time to expand. You know, Web3 moves fast. So that's when I started planning Moonshot, my bigger collection that came out in April of 2022. And tell us a little bit about how big that collection was. Collection, the collection Moonshot is 2,500 music NFTs, uh, five songs in total. Every song has its own artwork, and then it's got 500 versions of the same artwork. Uh, my dad, who's a Disney artist, worked on the art. The songs are the ones that I came to Nashville to record the previous September. So eventually, you know, I was able to use them. And um, yeah, we have a lot of utility tied to it. You know, I worked really hard in the space to get my name out there and my music out there completely organically with nothing, no money, nothing. A, a really small team. 
And we sold out 2,500 in five weeks and kept building from there. Well, I, uh, we're recording this in March of 2023, just a year and like a month or whatever, right? After you yeah. first got into this and you've come a long way and you're going to be for sure a source of inspiration for a lot of other creators and artists who are going to be following in your footsteps. And there are probably some listening right now. Um, and when I say creators, they could be digital artists, they could be musicians, they could be writers, they could be podcasters, you know, anyone who's creating, um, what? Some of them might be listening and be skeptical. So what do you want to say to these creators and artists and maybe fellow musicians as to why maybe they ought to consider, you know, launching their own project as an NFT? Yes. I mean, long answer, but the short version is there's two points. The blockchain technology allows you to go directly to the recipient of your art directly. You don't need anyone between you and the person that's going to enjoy or and invest in your art. You can do it A to B. You don't need anyone to help you. Uh, that allows you to have control over your art and therefore over your business and over how you want to sell. You know, you have just a better grasp and a complete grasp, really, of who your audience is and therefore control. And you get to decide what you want to put out there and whoever wants it, it's there. You don't need to rely on someone else to tell you how you should do it or who you should target. You know, you can just find it yourself. And so I, in my opinion, that is the main reason why, to take control. And I would imagine that for you as a music artist, you would have had to sell tens or hundreds of thousands of songs, maybe even millions of songs to equal the same amount of money that you sold in just hundreds and thousands. Is that fair? Is that a fair assessment as far as how that works? I can give you a very, very concrete example. One uh, single NFT mint from my last collection, one single one, 0.1 ETH equals 27,000 streams on Spotify. So, Dang. Okay. So, it's, so, it, so there is this little part that creators have to reframe in their brain. It's not about quantity here. It's about, it's about something different, right? It's about what is it about exactly? It is about that one-on-one -on -one co connection that you have to your recipient, whether it's your customer, your fan, your friend, your partner, you know, because your community at the end of the day gets so connected with you that you want them to have a say in your project. It's like you get direct feedback from your recipient, like what's better than that so that you can adjust what you do depending on, you know, where it's going and you can listen. To me, the biggest utility is the community because it inspires me, right? So I think it is about quality, about consistency, about awareness more than quantity. I'm not a huge fan of putting out a million NFTs for five cents. No, I think I want to do a good piece of art that I'm proud of, that is timeless, not follow the trends, do something that's going to be amazing in 150 years because everything else might die, but not art. So that's important. Um, and focus on the real ones that are there. Your 1000 true fans, you know, that thing is still, it's still here, it's still valid. You, uh, when I introduced you, I mentioned that you do a, um, daily space and you've mentioned the word community quite a bit. Um, community seems to be at the core of your success. Obviously you have talent, but talent without community seems to be a struggle for people that are trying to do what you're doing. And there's a lot of people that are like, wow, how do I build community? The good news is you didn't have a lot of time to build community. <laughs> Sounds like you did it like an accelerated way. So maybe you can share how you built community or you can share how others could build community based on what you've learned. Yeah, I think the best way to build community, like the number one ingredient is be true to yourself. Like find the thing you're good at and do it. And, and don't be greedy about it. Give it, give it, be generous, you know, give it to people because people are going to want to take it, right? So showcase it, put it out there, bring that, bring them value before you ask them for value, you know, show them that they need you and they can get something, you know, from hanging around you, right? Some value and just be consistent. Honestly, it's like I did, I did what I did because I spent 3000 hours on Twitter spaces doing what I do best, performing and chatting and telling jokes, you know, and 
making fun of people, putting people on the spot. I just was myself for, for a whole year consistently. And that's literally how I built it. I was very generous. You know, I take care of my community. I message them in private. I'm like, how you doing? Are you okay? You need anything? You know, one by one, you can do that, but it goes a long way. You know, it's a lot of time. I did spend a lot of time, but it goes a long way and it comes back. The value that comes back is unmatched. So tell us a little bit about what you, what you did in spaces, just so people can wrap their head around it. Cause like from day one, did you do this or just tell us a little bit about like what you did and, and kind of a little bit more about, about it, you know, because some people aren't going to be familiar with what you've done. Yeah. So maybe some people don't know, are not familiar with Twitter spaces. So maybe Twitter spaces are voice chat rooms on Twitter inspired by Clubhouse, I assume, where you're basically talking to people to all, o- all over the world. They're everywhere in the world in real time. And you can literally request to speak, raise your hand and tell whatever and say whatever you want to say. Right. And I realized that music NFTs were not really that popular. Not many people were playing music on spaces. And when people, when I was, you know, going up to these spaces and raising my hands to ask questions, people would look at my profile, realize I was a singer. And every time they would ask me to sing, they were like, sing us a song. What are you doing in the space? And I would sing my song and then I would tell them about what I was doing. And then people started, you know, the word started spreading and people started inviting me, come to my mint party, come to my, launch day come to my birthday party on spaces come and entertain us you know and that was my way of bringing the value uh and people came through for me afterwards you know so literally sat on my couch with my phone in my hand and my guitar right there browsing for spaces hitting request and asking to sing that's it (laughs) well and you know it's funny as i first heard you on uh s space it was like uh the mint party i think for the bulls and apes project and I heard you sing on there and then everybody was talking about you, right? Because obviously most people aren't singing on there and all of a sudden somebody comes on and we'll get to hear a little bit of your voice, uh, your singing voice later on, but everybody's like, whoa, that's amazing. And all of a sudden that draws attention to you. It's brilliant marketing, but then you started launching your own spaces, right? So tell us a little bit about what you've done with that. Yeah, pretty much immediately, you know, after only three weeks that I was in the space, uh, I was advised to start my own. So what my strategy was basically, and it still is, um, I host a space every day at the same time, 2 p.m. Eastern, my Twitter space is on, Monday to Friday. Uh, And I host it for like two or three, four hours, pretty much every weekday. And the rest of the day, I go to other people's spaces, I meet people, and I redirect them to my space that happens daily. And so you know where to find me, basically. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating. It's almost like, um, really, you're just, You're just working it. Like if it's kind of like in the old fashioned day, it's like going door to door, like you're going door to door and you're just, you've got your voice and perhaps a guitar and you're just performing everywhere. Right. And you're, you're knowing that you're smart enough. You got a taste of it, right? Like, okay, this seems to work. I'm going to do more of this. So how many, how many people come into your spaces when you are hosting them every day? Just out of curiosity, because you host them right in the middle of the day, right? Yeah. I mean, depends on the day. Depends on the day. Yesterday we had 22 people. Today we had 140. So it ranges. I think your, our average is maybe like 70, probably 70 uh, per day live listeners. And then people can go back and listen. So the total views and listens, I think it's about three, 400, something like that. Do you notice a lot of uh, regulars showing up? Oh yeah. Uh, every day. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Fascinating. Okay. So, um, I want to talk about the utility of your NFTs. You mentioned the word utility earlier. And um, for those that don't know, utility is a phrase that's used a lot in the NFT space. But um, what is it that they get? You mentioned originally with Moonshots, there was five songs or was that under, there was also five songs on another life, right? So not every NFT contains all five songs, right? So kind of explain maybe how all that works. Yeah. So the way I build my collections, you know, I basically put out music albums. Uh, you know, I want to make that's my ultimate goal is to put out my music in the form of albums. And so both Another Life, my last collection and Moonshot have five songs spread evenly throughout the collection. So every NFT has one of those five attached with its own unique artwork. So you have, you know, 5,200 different artworks for a song. I mean, I think that's pretty fun. And that's one utility. You know, you can pick the one that you love that suits you. 
and or the one with more utility. Utility is basically just the perks, the rewards you get for holding that token. You know, so think of it as a tiered membership, you know, token into a club, right? And so if you have a certain one that's more rare because it has maybe a design that you can't find in the collection very often, then you access my concerts for free for the rest of your life, for example, or my free free vinyl records. Well, I write a song for you, a custom song for you, or I can come and play a show for you in private. Um, so those are some of the utilities that I have. By holding just one, like an average one, you get to see me perform on Zoom every week for two hours. So that's like the utility everyone has. And they can use the song for projects like podcasts or things like that. What I like about what you've done is, for example, with your most recent collection, um, uh, Another Life, basically you could mint it, right? And then you had the art reveal like a week later or two weeks later. And the frames that are on the outside of it were a little different, right? And if you had X number of these frames, right, and 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 one particular kind of an NFT, then you could win an exclusive special one of one NFT, right? So what you're doing is you're kind of gamifying this a little bit, right? Encouraging people to buy multiple NFTs with certain kinds of rewards. Do you do that just during a certain window, or do you do that? throughout the entire, you know, duration of the, of the, of the mint. I mean, of the, I mean, is it only available at these perks? Yeah. It, it can be any time in the future that someone can collect all well, these? Well, no, I mean, that specific thing there, they haven't all been collected yet. They haven't all been claimed yet. So there's still three available yeah. uh, and there's a very special utility connected to that. But the gamification is across all my projects. Very, very intensive. Like, First collection, super gamified. Second collection, super gamified. And then we gamified the two together. So if you combine certain from the first one, certain from the second one, you access super high tier utility, like I'll write you a custom song or, you know, things like that, or I come to your house and perform, you know, those things are like for top tier collectors. Um and but even as far as like, you know, I have five songs, so I want to incentivize people to complete my album that's supposed to go. They supposed to go together. Right. So that's the basically the one way to access my concerts for free for the rest of your life is if you have a full album, you know. Very cool. OK, let's talk about your uh, launch of this most recent collection, Another Life. Um Considering that you've only been at this for like a year and a month, you've really dialed this stuff in. I mean, you're doing very creative things and everyone is listening. Hopefully you're beginning to understand everything that Violette is doing. You don't have to have a music NFT to be able to do what you're doing. This stuff could apply to any NFT collection, but talk to us about what you did on your second launch. And let's start with what you did for your original uh, collectors who had the first collection. Yeah. So Part of the utility of the first collection was that they would get the second one for free. So I needed to take care of them, you know, because without them continuously being a part of the community and the project, I wouldn't have been able to do the second one. So I decided that for each NFT from the first collection that they held, they would get a free one from the next collection. Some of those NFTs, the rare ones, even got two free because you really want to incentivize them, right? And, and reward them. And that was like, one of the best things I've ever done because I've seen them really, really happy. And some people who maybe had forgotten that they were part of my project then remembered. And they were like, oh my God, look, she's still here and like she's rewarding me. So you bring back your community members that maybe you lost along the way by sending them a gift, right? So that we did. Real quick on that. Uh, did you do a uh, claim or did you do a airdrop on that? Airdrop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So how, many, how many were in your initial collection? 2,500. Got it. Okay. So you did an airdrop to those people and that was a free gift for them. Keep going. Where, where were you going to go with what free else? you gift. Yeah. And additionally to airdropping those, uh, we spread out the sale basically across a few months because, you know, I, the, the, the crypto market is very unpredictable. And so I was like, I don't know what's going to happen in January, February. Now it's November. I know it's an okay time. I'm going to drop 500 this month, 500 next month with like a stand-in NFT. So we dropped a pass 
um, for a much cheaper price. Instead of 0.1, they could pay 0.06 in November, 0.08 in December. Uh, so that would be, and it was open to the public. Anyone could buy it. Uh, the first 500 we sold in 20 minutes in November. Wow. Yeah. And the second 500 that was a little more expensive in 10 hours, right before Christmas. So we basically sold a thousand from the Another Life collection through these stand-in NFTs uh, that people kept in their wallets for like two and a half months waiting to get their actual NFT, which I then also airdropped to them to thank them for waiting and trusting me. So I mean, it's so real quick. I want to I want to zoom in on this a little bit. So you had airdropped uh, a couple thousand to the original collection, and then you decided that you were going to pre-sell um, and give them some sort of special pass that would essentially, um, as long as they kept the pass, they would get an airdrop. There wasn't a claim mechanism. So there was no burn on that, right? It was just like, you keep this, you're going to get a, an airdrop. You did them in small chunks of 500. And how much was the, how much was the first one? 0 0.08, you said? First one, 0 0.06. Second one, 0 0.08. Okay. And they sold out really fast. And, and were you intentionally... Um, going to keep doing this? And why did you decide to do this in different states? Did you have an idea in your brain how big the collection was going to be by the time you were done with your marketing? Yeah, yeah. I had it all planned out. I knew how big the collection was. I knew that I wanted to do 5,200. I had do done like all the allocation in my head. I was like, okay, we're airdropping 2,571 to the original holders. Then we're left with about 2,500 of the rest, right? So how do I want to sell those? You know, I want to prioritize certain community members. You know, the early birds were not ready with the art, but I kind of want to start selling it already, you know, to do some of the heavy lifting before, right? So, yeah, we decided to do 500, 500, uh, and then leave 1,500 for the actual uh, mint that we just did. Uh, but actually, of those 1,500, I decided to allocate 400 to a community treasury to slowly reallocate, redistribute into the market, uh, to into the hands of my community to reward them for as rewards for bringing ideas to the project, to the community. A couple of quick questions on the 500 that sold out really fast. Were they, uh, did you use pre-mint for that or did you use any special tools for that? Or did you just say there's an allocation of 500? Here's where you go, go get them when they're gone, when they're, they're gone. That's kind of how you did it. Yeah. And then when you did the public launch, talk to us about that because it sounds like you partner with OpenSea. Is that correct for that? Like talk a little bit about how that worked out. Yeah. So after the second pre-sale that I did in December, uh, OpenSea approached me and they asked me if I wanted to partner with them for the final phase of the Mint um, because they had just implemented their OpenSea Drops feature where basically they were selecting projects to partner with to use OpenSea as the minting page, still retaining ownership of your smart contract and your IP, um, you could use OpenSea and be featured on the big homepage of OpenSea, right? That's where uh, I discovered your second collection. Yeah, so it was super cool. And I, I'm i like the second music artist to be there and the first album to ever launch on OpenSea, music album. So I was really excited. Um, and so we partnered on that. And of course, you know, it was amazing. We had big feature for three days our collection was on the home page so everyone went crazy and you know it was it was cool is there any special features that open c i've seen some of these open c collections where you can kind of allocate certain people to have certain access at certain times did you use any of that kind of stuff oh, on yeah. talk yeah. to us about how that worked it's the allow list allocation pretty much it's a pre-sale of that so we had you know guaranteed pre-sale with it that came with a discount so the first i think it was under allocated but we were able to sell like 500 for 0 0.09 instead of the actual mint price of 0 0.1 so people had to win that spot through collecting poaps from my spaces that i host every day and follow mm -hmm. their own space so i reward the people for supporting me giving them poaps plus doing a couple other steps, then they could get the final discount. Then we had another phase that was kind of a controlled public mint with a few wallets that could mint before it went 
to public and then eventually the public went. So, yeah. Um, we're, we'll get to the poaps thing in just a minute, but was it easy to, um, to, to, did OpenSea make it simple? I mean, was it, was it relatively straightforward? I mean, I know right now they're pretty soon, I mean, probably by the time this comes out, they're going to open up their, their launch portal for everyday people, according to the news that I've read. Yeah. It's, it's kind of exciting when, when it seems like it's kind of straightforward, right? Like you have to use a lot of tools to normally do what OpenSea kind of makes easy. I don't know what your thoughts are on it. Was it relatively straightforward or is it complicated? Are you able to talk about that? I Yeah, I'm able. I mean, I think my mint structure was not straightforward. So, you know, it's... It, it was a little more complicated than what yeah. they were used to. Got it. Okay. I think so. I think so because they just started it and maybe, you know, it's more, it caters more to more straightforward mechanics. Right. Me, because I had done all those pre-sales and the airdrops, you know, there was a few things we had to coordinate on that maybe they're not like they weren't quite uh, prepared for because they just launched and it's more for like people who just want to do a straightforward drop. Uh, but we made it happen at the end. It was pretty smooth. So, yeah. So you ended up launching on OpenSea and uh, a couple days into the launch, it appeared pretty obvious that you weren't going to sell out the collection, right? So you decided to make a decision you hinted at that earlier about putting it into the treasury. Maybe talk a little bit about what that means and why you decided to do that. So I think it's fair to say that the collection was would have sold out. So that's the one thing I want to tell people and artists, just because some people say if it doesn't sell out in the first couple of days or week, it means it's not going to sell out. That's not true. Because my collection last year took five weeks to sell out and people were telling me it's not going to and I'm like yes it is and it did so it was going to sell out but the reason why we decided to do um, this final mint into a treasury is because um, you have to kind of look at the floor price right of those that have been minted already and you have to protect them then we had to do the airdrops right for people that had been waiting since last year we wanted to do the reveal. It was only like the last 10%. So it was holding up everything, basically. Basically, it was holding up. Yeah. And we were like, come on. Like, seriously? And so I was like, you know what? It's just 10%. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to give it back to the community little by little. The majority of the collection is there. So let's just do it. One of the things you told me when we were prepping for this call is that a lot of artists don't keep things for themselves. And you kept a little bit more of this collection for yourself. Can you talk a little bit about the strategy behind that and and give a little wisdom to uh, fellow creators who might not think to do that? Yeah, I think so. Last year, for example, you know, I only kept 20 NFTs of mine for myself out of that collection. And simply because I couldn't afford to keep more. I had to sell them, you know, like I needed the money to live. I could even the little ones, you know. And then little by little, you know, I started rewarding, gifting them to people, doing giveaways and stuff. And I ended up with zero, pretty much. I had none. And so this time around, I'm like, wait, like, I can't even afford to buy my own NFTs now from OpenSea on secondary because they're too expensive. So I'm going to keep some, you know, for myself. And, you know, I use them for giveaways. I use them for, you know, maybe I give it to my, my family, you know, things like that. It's like me keeping my own CDs, you know, I can do that. Um, so well, yeah. there's also a strategy too, where if you keep a percentage of the collection for yourself and the collection goes up in value over time, especially because commissions are starting to go away, right? This is a way that you can essentially fund some stuff down the road. Cause if your collection goes up, you've got some for yourself, you can sell them over time and you can generate some revenue for your business. Right. I mean, I, I, the allocation to me is I have about like 60 NFTs that are my personal, right? So that's my personal treasury. Um, yes, I can do that with that kind of thing. But then we have a community treasury with 400 that I'm not a, I'm not allowed to touch. I'm not allowed to make profits from them. Talk to us I, about how you structured that. Yeah, yeah it's just 400, uh, roughly 400 NFTs that we keep there in case we need it to add things to the community. So I have actually a council in my community. The people that hold certain NFTs, they've gone out of their way to collect them. It's called the Nine Frames Council. And me with them, we'll make decisions, we'll vote, 
And every time, case by case, we'll be like, okay, this person did this for the community, brought in 60 floor sweeps. Should we reward that person with something from the treasury? Or is it worth us selling a gold? Maybe we can make this money and reinvest it here. So it's more like we're going to decide together. So yes, like you said, but they're not like my personal ones. You know, I'm not able to take profits from it. Did you set it up as a DAO or are you just kind of structuring it kind of like a, you know what a DAO is? Are you familiar with what a DAO yeah. is? Yeah. Yeah. No, we don't have the DAO structure. I I mean, ultimately I have the final say, you know, yeah. it's my project, but it's like, a, they're, they're like my counsel, you know? Yeah. So we just consult with each other all the time. I go to them. We meet every Sunday and I would, if they all voted no, I would never do it, you know? Yeah. 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 That's really cool. Um, let's talk about marketing. Um, we talked about spaces and um, what I'd love to talk about is this POAP stuff you mentioned earlier and also collabs. So talk to me about how you marketed the most recent collection. Did you do something different on the marketing side of things to kind of get everybody hyped up and ready for everything that was going on? And it sounds like you did with the, with the POAPs. So tell us a little bit about how that worked. Yeah. So differently from what I did in the first collection, I decided to do collabs with other projects. Collabs means for those that don't know, it's basically you partner with another project, another community, and you let them know about your drop and you offer them pre-sale spots, right? So you offer them a discount because you might like that community. You want to cross pollinate a bit. And so their collab manager is going to post it in their discord and you, they're going to raffle up a few spots. Uh, you know, for their community members to get into the pre-sale. So through our collab managers, we did about a hundred collabs with different communities. Um, and those that would win the raffles would get non-guaranteed allow list, meaning they don't get the discount. And if there's none left, too bad. Uh, but if they wanted to upgrade to guaranteed spot where it, you know they're going to mint, plus they get a discount, they had to combine their win with a POAP that they would collect from one of my spaces that I host every day so that they would hear about the project, that they would hear me saying they would know what they're doing. So, um, yeah, and also the POAP is really cool because people get a little memory, you know, and I've realized people were following me around all day to pick up the POAPs and they became obsessed with these POAPs because, uh, you know, they're just cool and they got you an allow a spot. So, yeah gets people engaged, you know? Okay. So, so it sounds like you use the POAPs in two different ways. One with the collab people, and then also some with the people that were just there inside or, or were the POAPs only used for people that you were doing collabs with? Because having interviewed people on this show, I know that there are, like you mentioned, there's people that this is their thing, right? They go out there, they have relationships with other communities and, and they do deals all the time. And it sounds like you gamified this a little bit, like, Hey, we'll do a basic collab with you, but we have this extra tier collab and you the only way to qualify is to come experience this one of my spaces right and because you knew this is like a timeshare sales experience right you knew if you can get them in there and they can experience the community and get hyped about it then they're gonna help promote this more inside their community is that kind of how that worked yeah for sure exactly so i wanted to like because my project is not you know like a hype kind of you know i don't want to ride on the hype I'm about the substance. So I wanted to make sure that people that entered those raffles for allow list knew what they were getting themselves into. And so that's why I put one condition. I said, if you want to get the guaranteed spot with a discount, you have to come to my space and collect a POAP so you know what you're doing. I don't want you to just do something that you're not aware of. Um, because I know that when people hear the story, hear the music, see the art, hear the community there's a better chance that they're going to want to join us you know so um that's how i decided to do it and then eventually everyone just loved the pull-up even people that were not interested in the collabs because maybe they were already in my community they were getting airdrops they just wanted to get the pull-ups you know how did you actually facilitate that pull-up experience during your live streams i mean during your spaces yeah so it was kind of funny because so you have to set it up prior so you have it it's going to happen like at one specific time. Um, the mint will stay open for like 15 minutes and you have to have a secret word that you have to spell out and people have to enter the secret word live within those 15 minutes and claim their POAP. 
So it was always complicated because like people wouldn't get the spelling, you know, you couldn't type it. You just had to say it. And people in Discord going crazy. What's the word? What's the word? Like it became a circus, you know, it was really fun. So, Yo, so does POAP allow you to set a, a, as small as a 15 minute window? They literally allow you to just, it's only good for 15 minutes. Yeah. Wow. So once you got their POAPs, you got their, um, uh, what do you call it? The wallet ID, right? So that's how you were able to figure out who, I mean, so, so does that mean everybody, how did you, did you have like certain kind of things? Like if you have X number of my PO apps, did you open up any kind of opportunities with that? Tell us about how that worked. If you yeah. Know. So the PO app leaderboard, so like 10 people with the most amounts of PO apps, then I put them in the allow list anyway. Even though they didn't have the, the, the collab win, I still rewarded them because they were with me all the time. So yeah, we kind of did that. And I mean, nothing, I think at the end of, you know, maybe every six months or so, I'm just going to look, you know, I, I stopped doing the pops, but I want to continue because I think it's really a good way to keep track of the people that come with you, you know, through your space and through your journey. So you can think of rewarding them. Is there anything else on the marketing side of thing other than collabs and, and, and the Twitter spaces with the PO apps that you did differently on this launch that you didn't do before? Was there any kind of collection of email addresses and, and, and notifying people over email or was it, you know, live stuff inside of Discord? I'm just curious if you did any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, so we did a lot of AMAs, like interviews with those exact communities that we did collabs with. So we would do a collab and then I would go into their Discord or into their Twitter spaces and play a, a concert for their community. Ah, okay, cool. So that's where also people could collect pull-ups. So during that space, I'd be like, okay, if you want the allow this giveaway, now collect the PO app from this space and then you can upgrade. But I would go at, in their houses, you know, I'd be like, hi, we did the collab and then we do an interview and then I play some songs. And so, yeah. I love the fact that you said we went in their houses because it kind of, this is kind of what you're doing. At least like you're coming into someone else's home. Yeah. You're, you're performing, you're creating an emotional connection with them, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just like in the old fashioned days when people would come into your home and they would have these parties, you know, like in the olden days, like they would have, sometimes they'll have like clothing parties or they'll have Tupperware parties if we go way back in time, right? And they'll try to sell you stuff. So fascinating. Um, all right, couple last questions and then I'd love to hear uh, an example of uh, a little bit of uh, your voice if we could share it with everybody. Um, if, first of all, where can people discover you on the socials? Like if they want to check out your spaces and then also uh, if people want to check out your website or you know if there's some sort of special place you want to send them where do you want to send them yeah absolutely um my twitter spaces go live uh on twitter at 2 p.m est every day um my twitter is at zeroni violetta so you can find me there you can find me on instagram you can find me on facebook although i don't even i don't really use it very much but you can join my discord server violettazeroni.com is my website i'm everywhere pretty much so and why don't you spell that out for people that are listening on the audio side of it as far as the Twitter? How do they find you on, how do they spell Violetta Zero? Violetta, yeah. V-I-O-L-E-T-T-A-Z-I-R-O-N-I. -I. So that's... Perfect. All right. Well, let's hear if you're willing to sing a little bit just because you're in my home today. So metaphorically, <laughs> I'll put you full screen and let's just hear a little example of uh, your beautiful voice. Sounds good. Here we go. Thank you so much. Um, pleasure. People are going to love this. So I'll give you guys a short, short verse and chorus, you know, of one of my last songs. This one's called In Another Life. The waves will keep on rolling on. The stars will always shine. Funny how some things just never change. They say, be careful what you want, seek and you shall find. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Maybe in another life, I set sail upon the ocean, catch the wind as seagulls fly. I don't care where I'm going Let the current kindly carry me To my island paradise Maybe, baby In another life 
You are amazing, Violetta. Zeroni, thank you so much for coming on and answering all my questions and sharing your art with us. We're so much better because of it. Thank you so much. Thank you.